Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy. Dr. Murphy, how are you this morning? Uh, doing quite well. Very busy. Dr. Robert Murphy is the executive director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID infectious disease and public health questions each week on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines and our lone U.S. COVID statistic through today, May 23rd. We invite you to submit any questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Our only COVID statistic we can report at this point from the US is that average COVID deaths per day are at 20 daily. In 2023, the same week, we saw 119 deaths. Dr. Murphy, your reaction to that number? Well, that's one of the lowest numbers we've seen ever. Um, and uh, that's great. And you're, we're going to see it kind of bouncing around at this kind of very low level uh, until about a month or two after the next peak. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's uh, a lot better than last year. I mean, last year was 119 cases. And so this is one sixth of that amount. So, you know, if these numbers stay uh, in that area, that's, that's really great because, uh, you know, only about... Uh, 1% of people die from COVID uh, who are infected. And um, uh, so, you know, you can extrapolate how many are really out there, but we're not measuring the cases. But we'll talk about other places uh, later in the show today uh, in places that do uh, measure it and what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest story today in the U.S. is that a second dairy worker in the state of Michigan has tested positive for H5N1, the avian flu. Can you break down what we know about that case and give us an update about where we stand with the avian flu? So H5N1 is the avian flu. It decimates birds. That's why it's named after them, avian flu. But it also affects other species. It can infect humans, but we get it from birds or it turns out other animals. So cows get it, but they don't die from um, avian flu so much, but they contaminate the milk. The milk infects the workers. So they're coming in actual contact with the milk, unpasteurized milk. Pasteurization turns out to kill milk. So the milk in your grocery store, if it's pasteurized, which almost all the milk is, you have to be careful in some health food stores if they sell unpasteurized milk. Very unwise thing to do at this particular point. But if it's pasteurized milk, which most milk is, you don't have anything to worry about. So we have another case in a uh, dairy worker in the state of Michigan, where I'm sitting right now. Um, and uh, the person had relatively mild symptoms, including conjunctivitis, which appears to be one of the common side effects of this type of flu to get the red eye. Um, person has done well. And why are we worried about this? Well, number one, if you do get avian flu, uh, if you look worldwide at the numbers, about half the people die. Now, we don't know internationally, globally, what was going, what's with these other people or whatever, but that's why everyone is so kind of hyped on avian flu. It does so far does not transmit human to human. It's only animals to humans. So if it mutates, though, perhaps it can begin to transmit. That's the whole fear behind it. That's why there's already vaccines approved for avian flu, and several are, or at least one big company is in the uh, process of getting approved for the vaccine. Because if this starts, if this mutates and it starts jumping to humans, and very few humans have had H5N1, it's going to be a crisis, and um, everyone's going to have to get vaccinated very quickly. So you know, people are kind of ready for this one, uh, if it does happen, and you know, maybe we'll be just lucky and it won't happen. But in the interim, everybody is watching this very closely. 
So the CDC recommends uh, for close contacts uh, of people who get it, if you're one of the unfortunate farm workers that gets it, is isolation. Uh, they don't have to actually go into full-blown quarantine. And the risk, which puts the risk to the general public very, very low. So it's just, it's a something that has to be watched very closely, but there's no, no reason to, to uh, panic uh, right now. So this whole thing started uh, with the cattle. Uh, it's been in the birds for a long time. Uh, in uh, March uh, of this year, um, well, it got to the cattle in April, but the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute started picking up H5N1 and treated wastewater on March 4th of this year. And that was about three weeks before the USDA uh, noted that it was starting to spread. Uh, and this is the same group that published that 19 to 23 sites uh, across the state of Texas uh, were positive. So that started this whole thing going. Um, and, you know, that's, it's a very recent finding. So, but everyone is concerned about it. But remember, no human to human transmission as of this point. And um, the uh, USDA will provide financial support to farmers whose herds have uh, not tested positive for avian flu for developing and implementing biosecurity and testing measures, and will also retroactively compensate farmers for lost milk due to infected herds. This is a very important public health approach and animal health approach, because otherwise people are not going to want to test because, you know, the herd gets isolated or, you know, it, it's just, it could be a disaster. So this is a very responsible way to handle uh, this condition right now. Absolutely. And we will keep up to date on any more information that comes out. It's unfortunate there has been another human case, but great to hear that the person has recovered. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to our COVID activity a little bit, Across the globe, you hinted at this, there have been a couple of small spikes and a little bit of larger spikes with COVID. Can you tell us where those are happening? Yeah, so some places are still monitoring how much COVID is going on, and this includes Singapore. So Singapore, um, May 18th, the Ministry of Health there reported in the week of May 5th to 11th, there were 15,900 positive cases. And that was compared to 13,700 the week before. So this rise um, in hospitalizations, also this rise resulted in an increase in hospitalizations as well. But so far the ICU admissions are down. Now ICU admissions always come later. So it might just be the natural progression of the disease or we, I, I don't know, but maybe they're treating the patients better. Maybe they're all, the sick ones are getting Paxlovid or Molnupiravir or one of the other drugs. So, there's a, you know, because those, whether you're vaccinated or not, um, you know, uh, prevent serious disease uh, developing, as do, of course, the vaccines. So we don't we don't know anything about that part right now. But <clears throat> the ICU admissions uh, have remained stable and low. Um, so they looked at the the virus. It's mostly these flirt variants we've been talking about, KP1 and KP2, which makes up about two thirds of the cases. And it doesn't seem to be behaving any differently. Uh, around the world where they are monitoring a little more closely in the UK, they've seen a very modest rise um, up about 18% uh, in hospitalizations. Um, and that's the only thing that's really been reported. But what I think this means to us is that there could be a spike here in the United States as well. Um, remember back when Delta came out, you know, everyone thought that the thing was going away in 2021 and, you know, oh, we're happy it's gone. And then all of a sudden in August, way early, because normally these respiratory viruses come in the, uh, in the early fall, early and late fall, and we had this big spike at the end of July and beginning of August. So we we'll just have to wait and see. Something to keep our eye on to the extent that we can. Now, there was more COVID research, lots of COVID research still happening. Uh, 
about the difference between COVID severity and flu severity, because we've known for a long time that COVID is deadlier than the seasonal flu, oh. but that relationship has shifted a little bit. Can you explain oh. the findings? Well, when COVID came out, nobody had any, very virtually no one had any immunity to COVID. And that's why it was so severe at the beginning. Now, so many people have had the vaccine and so many people have gotten COVID that we have more immunity. So the difference in outcomes between COVID and flu have, have narrowed. But in this big study uh, done at the, uh, in the veteran, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, published uh, last week in JAMA Network Open, that uh, among 11,000 veteran data that they found, 5.7% of COVID patients died within 30 days of hosp hospital admission, while 4.2% of uh, influenza patients died. So that's that's a difference. It's a 35% difference for people who get hospitalized with either one of those infections. So COVID, still a bad disease. It's still worse than influenza. And that means got to keep up with your vaccinations. There'll be a new COVID vaccine this fall. You can take it on the same day as your influenza vaccine. And we have to continue to take COVID seriously. Mm -hmm. And on that topic of vaccination, for those 60 plus, the RSV vaccine was available to them throughout this entire respiratory season. Unfortunately, we saw very low uptake. Can you tell us what the uptake was and maybe a little bit of why it was so low? Yeah, this is a little bit of a puzzle um, in that the uptake, RSV is another nasty respiratory <laughs> disease that kills quite a few people. Um, and these surveys and, and uh, information that's coming out is that patients in general have heard of RSV. Now, RSV was not in the, in the vernacular, you know, just a couple of years ago. Um, and you'd hear about RSV and people with organ transplants and, you know, but the general public didn't hear about it very much, even though many of them are at risk, older people in particular. But 85.7% of people said they had heard of RSV and 83% knew that there were RSV vaccines out there. So how come only 26% of people are taking the vaccine? Why is the gap threefold, more than threefold? Uh, so in the survey, they find that only 17.7% reported that a healthcare worker asked them to discuss RSV vaccination at their most recent vaccination visit. Now, when you go into your EPIC chart, there's a list of immunizations. Basically, RSV is not on there. I mean, maybe in some places it is, but in many places it's not. And it's not even coming, the healthcare workers are not even bringing it to the attention of these people. I mean, I went into my own doctor recently and they said, oh, you need an updated tetanus shot and you need an updated pneumonia shot. And they didn't say anything about RSV, which I had at Walgreens, but uh, the, and it wasn't even, it wasn't even on, on that chart, you know, it wasn't even asked, but this is, this is, uh, this is unfortunate because the healthcare workers, the primary healthcare workers should be pushing RSV vaccine in the 60 and older. These people are at risk for getting it. We've got, you know, it's mostly a seasonal uh, infection and it, it can be lethal um, and it can be prevented. The vaccine works great. I mean, one dose of the GSK RSV vaccine has an efficacy of 94.1%. Oh, that's really, that's incredible. Uh, I had the vaccine myself and uh I don't have any side effects at all. I've taken all the vaccines, but you know, most of them. I need my flu shot. I mean, I need my um, tetanus shot to be done and stuff like that. I'm going to get that done. But um, uh, this is uh, really um, it, a very easy one shot way to avoid getting a very serious disease this fall. So if you're 60 or over, 
or you have some underlying immunocompromised status, go get this vaccine. Mm -hmm. And now, unfortunately, from one under vaccination situation to another, there has been a lot of reporting in the U.S. about MPOX surges possibly happening this summer. There have been a lot of global surges as well as here in the United States. Can you break down that uh, issue for us? Yeah, through uh, March 28th, um, there were 570 U.S. MPOX cases um, compared to less than 300 at the same time in 2023. So MPOX going up. Now, you have to come in contact with the lesion to get this. Um, but why are, are we having these increases, particularly in New York and Chicago? Chicago had 63 cases, New York had 191. Uh, when we have a vaccine for this. So the Genios is the only FDA approved MPOX vaccine has been available for quite a while. And it works, it works really well. It's um, 68 to 75% effective after one dose and 86 to 89% after two doses um, with a booster every two to 10 years following that. So we know the people that are at risk for MPOX and like why they're why the uptake is like only about 25% is just another like what's going on here? People just want to get MPOX. Now MPOX has only killed a few people um, in Western countries. Uh, and that's because it's mostly clade two, which is a slightly milder form of MPOX. Um, clade one is mostly in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They've had uh, 20,000 estimated infections and 975 deaths. That's 4.9%. Um, a lot of children get it. This is mostly animal to man uh, transmission. Um, but that has actually spilled over to the Republic of Congo. So that's Republic of Congo is a different country than the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So um, the Republic of Congo has started having some cases. They have 19 recent cases of this clade one. Um, sometimes they call it Republic of Congo, Congo Brazzaville, and then the other Congo, Congo Kinshasa or, or DRC. People know it by DRC. So anyhow, uh, that's clade um, uh, one. Uh, so we um, <clears throat> uh, have to, that is not circulating in the United States right now. We just have the clade two. But it totally preventable, almost totally preventable with the vaccine in a very select population and people are not taking it. Um, I just don't understand why, but you know, hopefully we can improve that somehow. And while the clade two MPOX here in the United States and around the world has killed fewer people, I understand it still can cause some pretty well, severe symptoms. Oh, you could, I, yes, we see MPOX actually pretty much regularly in the clinic and uh, it's very painful and a lot of discomfort, disfiguring while you have it and, you know, and you've got to stay isolated, you know? So it's, it's not a, you don't want, you don't want to get MPOX. No, not at all. You don't want to get it. It's a nasty disease, even though it's uh, over 99% survive it. Mm-hmm. Now, to finish off on a high note for public health here in the United States, there were recent reports that through the year 2022, male HIV infections in the U.S. dropped by 12%. Can you break that down for us? That's great. Uh, finally, some good news, um, some benefits of good public health. Uh, according to the CDC, HIV infections in men 13 and older dropped 12% in 2022 compared to 2018. That's the largest decline observed among the uh, the youngest of the these groups. Um, among really young boys, thirteen to fourteen, there was a thirty percent drop. Um, no change was observed in those twenty five to sixty four. So it's really been focused on the young, and that's where a lot of the public health emphasis has been placed. It works. 
Black Americans saw the largest decrease at 18%. Well, there was negligible decreases in other groups. And um, there was a, a, the biggest decrease was in the US South. So where a lot of these public health efforts have uh, been done, have been implemented. And so um, this is actually really good news. Um, and the reason for this is uh, that there's still estimated some 32,000 new cases, new cases, brand new cases of HIV every year. Um, and 86% of are them uh, are in men. So they're trying to really focus who is getting it and this targeted approach, which is, uh, is leading to a result with a 12% overall reduction. So 12% double digits is good. Take what you can get. But, you know, of course we can't, um, um, we can't give up trying to decrease HIV. As soon as we get fewer new cases, um, then the number of people naturally dying from HIV, um, we will not see a decline in the overall cases. So there's still more new cases than deaths. So, but we're getting close. Um, and uh, many of these people are not dying from HIV anymore. They've lived with it for decades. Um, they have other problems um, that, you know, can you know, cause serious illness as they get older. So um, it is uh, good that we're seeing this decline. And, but we have to be, we have to persevere and we have to continue with these efforts uh, to help people decrease their risk for infection. Absolutely. And on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for your time and your expertise, breaking down all of these articles and our lone COVID statistic for the day. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Ask Dr. Murphy series. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you again next week. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down in the comments below or any of our social media in the description. Have an excellent weekend.